Good morning, church. Good morning. Take this off so you can understand me. There you go. <laughs> and see my my face here. But thank you for coming to Three Stones Church. We are glad you're here on this God's day that He has given us this day. Um, the only announcement we really have this morning is uh, we have an elders meeting this Wednesday, and if you would kindly lift up the elders in preparation, that you. Pray over them that uh, they've got good godly decisions for your church. And uh, we just thank you for all the prayers that you have been giving to us. So with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer for our prayer of confession. O oh, maker and upholder of all things, day and night are yours. They are also ours, a gift from you. The night to rid us of the cares of the day, to refresh our weary bodies, to renew our natural strength. 
the day to summon us to new activities, to give us opportunity to glorify you, to serve your people, to acquire knowledge, holiness, eternal life. But one day above all days is made especially for your honor and our improvement. The Sabbath, remind us of your rest from creation, of the resurrection of our Savior, and of his entering into repose. Your house is ours, but we are unworthy to meet you there and are unfit for spiritual service. When we enter it, we come before you as sinners, condemned by conscience and your word. For we are still in the body and in the wilderness, ignorant, weak, in danger, and in need of your help. But encouraged by your all-sufficient grace, let us come to your house with a lively hope of meeting you, knowing that there you will come to us and give us peace. Our souls are drawn out to you in longing desires for your presence in the sanctuary. Let us cry to you with broken hearts for grace and forgiveness. We long for that blissful communion of your people in your eternal house in the perfect kingdom. These are the people that follow the Lamb. Lord, make us one. Lord, prepare our hearts so that we may be changed into what you, into what you desire. In Jesus' sweet name we ask all these things. Amen. Amen. Okay. And if you would... Please stand with me for our call to worship. It's from Colossians 3, 12 through 16. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you all also must forgive. And above all, these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiveness in your hearts to God. Please remain standing as McKay will come up and lead our first song. Please join me in our first hymn, Come Christians Join the Sin. looking forward to being gathered with all y'all on that blissful shore, singing forevermore praises to our God and King. I'm going to take this moment now to talk 
to the youngest ones, and a couple of them aren't here this morning, the Carianos are out of town, but they may be watching or may watch later. So I want to talk to them and to the rest of us. Proverbs Song now. Maybe that'll help. <laughs> Proverbs 22 6 tells us this train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he was old, he will not depart from it. So, for younger ones, there is a way for you to go. And that's what I want you to remember. There is a way that God has intended for you to grow up. Now, it's, it's different for different people. Right? Different, different young people will grow up and do different things. Some people will grow up and be teachers, some doctors, some nurses, some farmers, some missionaries, some pastors, some moms and dads, all sorts of different things. There's a different way for everyone. And so for the adults, what, what we do is to help them find that way. This is not training like we think of training, you know, a, a lion with a whip, right? Or, 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 or training a dog with treats. This is to do what we want. This is helping young people to know what God is calling them to do. And later today, we're going to hear from Romans 1 again, and it's the, the, the emphasis will be on walking by faith. And one of the greatest ways we as adults can help young people, whether we're parents or whether we're we're, we're fellow church members, whether we are their brothers and sisters in Christ. The, the thing that we can do is to walk faithfully before them, to be Christians, and to talk to them about those things. You know, Deuteronomy says to, to talk about them when you, when you, in the morning, when you get up, and at night, when you go to bed, and, and, and during the day as you're going to places you go. Well, that's moms and dads, but it also applies to the rest of us because when they come here on Sunday and they see us, they, they should know us and they should know that we are Christians. That we who all do all of those different things I was talking about and many, many more, we have lots of occupations right here, lots of moms and dads here, grandparents here, all that sort of thing. All those things, that all those kinds of people can be Christians and that Christians can be all those kinds. Lord God, we thank you and praise you for our youngest members. Lord God, may we be worthy of the calling. May we find the joy in the calling of helping them to walk by faith, helping them find the way that you would have them go. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we will continue our reading of the Old Testament, the book of Ruth. In this passage, chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, we hear that Boaz remained obedient to the law of God, and God faithfully rewarded him in a way that neither Naomi, nor Ruth, nor Boaz, nor the leaders could have possibly seen or even imagined preserving the line of Jesus. Please stand in reverence to God's holy word. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to another. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the owners and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon. I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses, may Rachel, may the Lord make this, make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together build up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez and whom Tamar bore to Judah. 
because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. You may be seated. Let us continue in prayer to our Lord and Savior. Lord, give ear to our prayer this morning as we come before you. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Make me know your ways. O Lord, teach me your path. Teach me in truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Lord, each week at this time, you know that we pray for specific things. And usually they're for outside the walls of Three Stones Church. We pray for our partners in the gospel. We pray for our missionaries and those that do missionary work around the world. We pray for our country, our leadership, and many other things. All of which are very important and all of which we will accomplish as we continue to pray this morning. But this morning, Lord, I cry out to you to hear our prayers for healing, wisdom, and compassion. I pray, Lord, for Three Stones Church and each person in this congregation to hear the words of David as he prayed, the Lord is my light and salvation whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold of my life. To whom shall I be afraid? I pray this morning. Lord, I lift up my brother. in Christ, in our pastor, I pray with confidence and boldness, for you are the great healer. I lift him up as he prepares for surgery at the end of the month. I pray for wisdom for the doctors. I pray for a steadiness of their hands and a heightened ability during this procedure as he has his thyroid removed. On the 26th, Lord, and I pray for your Holy Spirit to be in that room and for his presence in that room to have an impact on everybody that prepares and participates. Lord, may Nate know that Pastor Jim Dorton is different than anybody else that they will touch. May they feel your presence with him and through him. I pray for Kathy and the kids as they continue to go through this process, Lord, may they feel the peace of your presence and the Holy Spirit with them. And I lift up my brother in Christ, Jeff Townsend, as he prepares a message.
for the end of the month. Lord, I pray for peace for him. I pray for you to give him the words that he needs to be prepared to speak your gospel to us. And I know, Lord, sometimes it sounds selfish to pray for ourselves. But I know that you tell us that it's okay, that we can pray for ourselves, we can pray for our needs. And that we're not being selfish by doing those things. So I pray, Lord, that for the rest of this month, that we would pray for ourselves as a church, as a congregation, as we go through change, both with directives from the government, in our community. I pray for confidence for this congregation, Lord, that we would be the salt and light that you call us to be. Embolden us. Give us confidence in your word. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding. Let, let's not judge those that may think differently than we do about this COVID and changes in our government. Lord, let us trust in you. That you do things that we don't understand, and it's okay not to understand them. Because your plan is greater than anything that we can think, anything that we can put on paper. There's a lot of talk, Lord, in the world today. Let your name be greater in those conversations. I pray for the churches in our community. I pray that they feel your presence with them, and I pray that they have an environment of repentance, Lord, that they would draw closer to you, that they would understand the urgency of the work that you have placed before them, Three Stones Church included. I pray that we would hear your Holy Spirit. And I pray for a steadfastness in the faithfulness to the gospel. Pray for Hope Bible Church in Seaford Board as they are a new church sprung up to, to preach your gospel and your love to those in a community that is in need. I lift praises for Pastor Jill Vargas, Gil Vargas, who recently graduated from seminary this month, Lord and strengthen him, embolden him, that he would stand mighty for your work. And I pray for specific things that Pastor Gill has requested. I pray that God would continue to use Hope Bible Church in reaching the community of Seaford and spreading the gospel. I pray that their board of elders would remain faithful and united. I pray that they would train men for leadership to strengthen the foundation of the church. And I pray that the saints of that church would come to know more deeply about what membership means and how to use their gifts. I pray for our nation, Lord. 
I pray for the men and women of the military, as this month is Military Appreciation Month. They sacrifice so much for our freedoms to be able to gather here, to be able to speak your name, to be able to read your word. They protect our freedoms and they keep us safe from persecution. Lord, may they know and feel you with them always. And I pray for the leadership of our country from the smallest of towns to the largest of cities to the house at 1800 Pennsylvania Avenue. I pray, Lord, that you work through them and if they don't know you, Lord, I pray that you would break them to their knees. This country needs you more than ever. The leadership of this country needs you more than ever. And I just pray that your light would shine brightly across this land. Lord, I pray for the missionaries around the world. They do trust you. They're not afraid to walk in your name. And I pray for protection for each and every one of them, especially in the world that we live in today. I pray for Corey and Rebecca and their girls, that their trust in you would grow mightily, that they would show us how to step out in faith. As they prepare to go back to the missionary field and leave the comforts of the United States, I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would go with them. And I pray for the relationships that they leave behind, that those relationships would find peace in you, knowing that you go with them, and that you would always be with them. And Lord, I pray for David Xavier, somebody that none of us knew until this morning when his letter showed up. He's a prisoner in Maryland. He's a Christian living in a very violent world. And he has reached out to the one place that he found comfort and in his memories he enjoyed Delaware and how he found Three Stones Church, Lord, I don't know, but you do. And I am grateful, Lord, that his letter showed up in our office. He's asking for prayer. He's asking for strength. He's asking for someone to reach out to him. And there is no doubt in my mind that this letter showed up at Three Stones Church because you have entrusted him to us. I pray for peace for him as he finishes his time served. I pray that we would lift him up 
that he would be encouraged in his new life with you. He's leaving prison with no family. His mother's gone. The people that he remembers in Delaware have passed. But you have given him hope through us. And I'm grateful for that. And Lord, lastly, I just ask that you again would hear our prayers and keep us from stumbling. Help us to find great joy in your presence and glory in your calling for each of us. May we hold each other accountable. May we lift each other up in encouragement. May we find peace and joy in being Christians and being in your house. We pray these things in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. stand for our next hymn, Jesus Be the All.
loved that him. Jesus paid it all. You know, many of us uh, have done some sort of planting. I'm off again, aren't I? One of these days I'll get this down. Many of us have done some kind of planting of something or another and growing of, of whether it be flowers or, or corn or whatever. And, and, and you start with a seed, right? Where do you get the seed from? Well, it, it, it comes from God. Now, you may go to the store and buy it. You, you, you may save it from something that you planted before, but, but it, it comes from God. Everything that comes up out of the earth comes from God, right? So you, you take that seed that you get from God, and what do you do with it? And you give it back to God, right? Like, I can stare at a kernel of corn all day long and not change it. Right? I've got I've to give it back to God, and then he does, you know, one plant, one water is only God makes it grow, right? That's, that's true of all that stuff. That, and when I, when I sing that song and I say, I hear, I hear my Savior say, thy faith indeed is small. I think of the, the parable of the mustard seed, right? The, the smallest seed, and it grows into the biggest bush or the biggest tree, right? What, what, what do you do with that seed? Yeah, right? They had to put it, give it back to God. What do we do with our faith? It's given to us from God. Faith is a gift from God. We give it back to him, and it grows. Well, we are returning this morning to uh, our look at the book of Romans. We'll be looking at uh, primarily the last part of verse 17. Uh, if you would like to mark a couple of other spots, we're also going to look at uh, the book of Hebrews, um, chapter 10, and some after that, but we'll start at chapter 10, and also 2 Corinthians 5. So Hebrews 10 and 2 Corinthians 5. And we're just going to jump right in. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, start off by turning to the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. Lord God, we do thank you and praise you for the gift of faith. Our guiding principles as we walk the Christian life. And we thank you that, that if we're wise enough to take what you've given us and release it back to you, that you indeed will grow it. Lord, may some of that growth take place here this morning as we hear your word. May your Holy Spirit work in our minds, in our hearts, in our bodies, growing our faith this morning, helping us to walk by faith. In Jesus' name. So I'm going to read uh, Romans 1. I'm going to read verses 15 through 18. Again, we'll be focusing on the latter part of verse 17. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Last week we looked at the first part of this short but powerful verse, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. We saw that the prime motivation, the, the force behind Paul's life's work, this preaching of the gospel, is that the gospel is God's saving power and God's righteousness is revealed in it, in the gospel. That righteousness of God, the perfectly pure, perfectly sinless, perfectly moral, perfectly holy, perfectly righteous standard of God is seen in his gospel. When we hear the gospel, we hear God's righteousness. When we see the gospel, we see God's righteousness. When we know the gospel, we know God's righteousness. And when we share the gospel, we share God's righteousness. And as we speak, the Holy Spirit then reveals and his righteousness is revealed from faith to faith. And we said, that means from the believer to the unbeliever, that's evangelism, from faith 
for potential faith from the believer to other believers. That's discipleship. But it starts off in the gift of faith that God gives to us. Ephesians 2.9. God gives us a gift of faith. A saving faith. And that saving faith, we, we, we live from faith for faith. That, that, that God gives us takes us from the original saving faith and to the faith that will take us home into glory. So that brings us to today in the last part of this verse. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So from faith to faith, from start to finish, the gift of faith that saves us to the faith that carries us into glory. And in between those things, in between being saved and in between, in, I'm sorry, in between being saved and entering heaven is a life of faith. The righteous shall live by faith. That makes sense, right? Well, sure it does. And it's, it's, it's simple. It's a plain truth. But there are deep implications. So we'll break it down. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Okay, first, as it is written. If you look in your Bible, you'll see that there's, there's quotation marks that, in, in, uh, that surround the righteous shall live by faith. The little book of Habakkuk is one of the minor prophets, and they're called minor prophets not at all because they are of lesser importance, just because they're smaller books. And indeed, Habakkuk is only three chapters long. Habakkuk was a contemporary of Jeremiah. He was a man of vigorous faith. And he wrote his book of prophecy about six centuries before the time of Christ, in what were deep, dark, frightening days for Israel. And he was perplexed. He was perplexed by the evil and the wickedness and the, the conflict and the oppression that were rampant in Judah. And in his eyes, God wasn't doing anything about it. So these three chapters that make up Habakkuk are, are two complaints that Habakkuk makes to God and, and God answering him. Habakkuk asks, why does evil in Judah go unpunished. And God answers, the Babylonians will punish Judah. And then the back of gas, how can God use wicked Babylonia to punish a people more righteous than themselves? And God answers, Babylonia will be punished and faith will be rewarded. And then the book closes with Habakkuk's beautiful confession of faith, his confession of his understanding. He, he gets it down. He puts his trust in God. And right in the middle of that book, in God's second answer to Habakkuk, which leads him to that beautiful confession of faith, right in the middle, God is answering him, and God speaks of the wicked, the unbelievers. And then God himself makes this contrast between the wicked and those who follow God. And he says this, the righteous shall live by faith. So back, going back to Romans 1, if you look at the footnotes or the cross-references in your Bible, where it says it is written, it will say that Paul is quoting Habakkuk, because Habakkuk wrote it down. But he's actually quoting God Almighty. It is the Almighty God who has determined, who has said, who has told us that the righteous shall live by faith. Paul quoted this again in the letter to the Galatians, and the writer of Hebrews also quotes it, because it's important. The Almighty God says, the righteous shall live by faith. So then it seems that the question would be, then, who are the righteous, and what does it mean to live by faith? How are they supposed to live? How are the righteous supposed to live? And who are the righteous? Righteous. I mean, we can flip the page and look over at Romans 3.11 and see Paul, and he's quoting two of the Psalms there that says, None is righteous. No, not one. So who are the righteous? In chapter 3, he also says, all have, fall, I'm sorry, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All. Everybody. Everybody except Jesus, right? So, so who are the righteous? Well, we go to Romans 5.19. For as by one man's disobedience, referring to Adam, who, who started the fall, for as one man, by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made 
righteous. And that one man is Christ. Through his obedience, we are made righteous. This is so important. It's not the first time you've heard it, but we cannot save ourselves. We can't earn righteousness. We can't attain righteousness on our own. We, we can't do enough good things. We can't come to church enough. We can't teach enough uh, Sunday school classes or Bible studies. We can't witness it. There's nothing we can do enough to gain righteousness. And without being righteous, we'll never see God. Without being righteous, we'll never enter heaven. Never. I was in a, a group discussion with some pastors the other day, and, and one confessed that some 20 years before, uh, his uncle had done some work for him, and he didn't feel his uncle had, had done right, so he didn't pay him. And then his uncle died. And, and it was eating away at him. He, he, he became a, a, an adult. He went into the ministry, and he went and he reconciled with his aunt, who had completely forgotten what had taken place. Another guy mentioned something like 20 years before in college when he had swiped a sweatshirt from one of his coaches. And they were both like, yeah, you can go back. You can go back. That 20, even if it's been 20 years, you can go back and make amends. And I was like, yeah, that's, a, that's great. But it's not just 20 years ago, it's 20 minutes ago. Like Sin is in our lives. I, I wish I could say I hadn't sinned by anything I had thought, said, or done for 20 years. It simply wouldn't be true. This is why Luther hated this verse, what I mentioned last week. Martin Luther hated this verse because he thought, if I have to be righteous to enter heaven, I know Jesus paid for my sins, but I still stand here as an unrighteous man. How do I enter heaven? And then he came to understand how God could allow him into his heaven. The answer is a simple one, and it's beautiful. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this, You must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Anyone that wants to enter the kingdom of heaven, their righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. Well, the natural response 2,000 years ago, and, and now is, who, me? I can't be perfect. Me? I'm, so, I'm to be perfect as my heavenly Father is perfect? Later on, Jesus would summarize the law with two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And I love those. But I don't do either one of those perfectly. We cannot, no one but Jesus ever could, by their own efforts, be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect. And no one but Jesus could love God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and his neighbor as himself. So we have a problem. None is righteous. No, not one. We have a problem. It's a congenital problem. We're born with it. It's called sin. We're born in sin. We're born stuck in the muck and the mud of sin. We can't climb out of it. There's no way out by our own strength. But we hear the psalmist who said what? I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me up out of the pit, out of the muck and mire. He set my feet upon a rock and he made my footsteps firm. I stood there stuck with no way out. He, God, did all the work to lift me out. You see, that's why Jesus lived a perfect life in full obedience to the law of God. In his every thought, in his every word, in his every action, Jesus came, yes, with a mission to die on the cross, right? To, to, to pay the penalty for our sins. But he did more than that. He came to live a life of perfect righteousness. Perfect righteousness. So then in chapter 3, Paul writes, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. That's where the righteousness comes from. Through our faith in Christ, the righteousness of God is placed on us, it's, it's placed in us, it's given to us. There's, a, there's this church word, it's called imputation. Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. And dear God, our sin is imputed to him. Sometimes referred to as the, the great exchange. 
My sin is placed on Christ. His righteousness is placed on me. Isaiah tells us that all my righteous deeds are like polluted garments, but God clothed me with garments of salvation. He covered me with robes of righteousness. As Paul also wrote to the church of Corinth, God made Jesus to be sin. Jesus who didn't know sin, meaning he never participated in sin, God made him sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We actually become the righteousness of God. So, so when it says that in the gospel, the righteousness is revealed, and we talked about those other ways, it's also revealed this way. It's revealed in us when we're saved. God's righteousness is revealed when we're born again. That, that grows inside us, his righteousness. There's no more powerful truth than that. So there's that old evangelism question, right? If you die tonight and you stood before God, and God said to you, what reason can you give me that I should let you enter in my heaven? The only answer can be, and the only answer is, this is all my hope and plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. See, Jesus' work on the cross does more than pay your penalty for sin and kind of set you back to zero. Like, like there's kind of a neutral place and your sin took you over here and Jesus brings you kind of back to zero and then see how you do from there on. It's not that at all. It makes you the righteousness. It makes me the absolute righteousness of God. We're not yet righteous in ourselves, but we possess Christ's righteousness. It's, it's placed in our account. It's deposited in our account. And we're seen by God himself as sinless, as Jesus is sinless. So the question again, who are the righteous? The righteous are all whom Christ has saved. He saves us. Christ saves us. Jonathan Edwards said we contribute nothing to our salvation but the sin that makes it necessary. So Paul said to the Ephesians and to us, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this faith is not your own doing. This faith is the gift of God not a result of works that no one can may boast. We are his workmanship. If you're a Christian, then you are the handiwork of God. God has created something in you. He's created you as a righteous being. If you're a Christian, God gave you faith. By that faith that God gave you, you believed in Christ. And Christ has saved you. If you're a Christian, then the Holy Spirit has made you righteous. And the righteous shall do what? The righteous shall live by faith. Paul wrote to the Galatians, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. In the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, I live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. So how do we do that? Well, living by faith, let me start here, includes all the things that, that we emphasize frequently here. That I'm going to just list some of them. We're not going to go into them because you've heard them before and changes are, you'll have, you will hear them again. But it includes reading your Bible and studying your Bible and praying and worshiping. Worshiping together, worshiping as a family, worshiping by yourself. It includes sharing the gospel and serving and giving and fasting and all those things they're extraordinarily important in living by faith. And I'm just going to leave all those there for now because there's some other things that we need to get into. So if you'll turn with me to the book of Hebrews in chapter 10. And if I could be so bold as to make a suggestion that will make your day better today and make your week better this week, go home this afternoon and read Hebrews chapters 10, 11, and 12. And then start tomorrow, read, start, go back to Hebrews 1, and through this week, two or three chapters at a time, read the book of Hebrews. You'll be done by Thursday. So read it alone. Husbands, read it with your wife, with your family. I'd like to read all these chapters now, but it would take us longer than we probably want to be here. So I'm just going to um, kind of do some run through and hit some highlights. So starting off at Hebrews 10 and verse 
14. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Well, he is Jesus. The single offering is his work on the cross. And what, what was accomplished? Our perfection for all time. Still working on it here, right? Still being sanctified here, but into eternity, us all being perfect. Verses 16 and 17, God speaking, the Holy Spirit speaking. This is the covenant I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. How does that make you feel? Great. It should. Indeed, it should. Every sin, David says, is against God. Everything we've done wrong is against God. If I had to stand before God right now, I would feel terribly ashamed. The day is coming when God will put all of that away. It will all be put to death. Down to verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. Well, that's a good way for us to live by faith, to walk by faith, right? To, to keep meeting together, to stir one another up to love, to stir one another up to good works. In verse 39, I love this. So there's two groups of people. In all of history, there are two groups of people, believers and unbelievers. There's two groups of people, the, the sheep and the goats. There's two groups of people. We are not of those. We are not of that group, right? We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. We are of those who have faith and preserve their souls. And then to help us to live by faith, God gave us this beautiful passage called Hebrews 11, often referred to as the, the Hall of Faith. It started off in verses 1 through 3. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was made out of things, was not made out of things that are visible. And then he goes through, and this word, this phrase, by faith, how people live, by faith, the righteous shall live, how? By faith, 26 times in these next few verses, as he goes through this list of great examples that we have. By faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice. By faith, Enoch was taken up without dying. By faith, Noah became the heir of righteousness. By faith, Abraham looked forward to a city whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah, who was born barren, who could not have children, had a baby in her old age, whose descendants are as innumerable, innumerable as the grain of sand on the seashore. And it goes through just all these people who lived by faith. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. Yeah, you know, when, when Moses was not allowed to enter in the promised land, but God took him up on the mountain and let him see. And then Moses went to a better place. Well, all of these people, they did not yet see, but they could see from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. And then again, by faith, Abraham offered up Isaac. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph. And by faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him from Pharaoh to save him. And by faith, Moses chose to be mistreated with the people of God rather than to be in sin, for he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. Check that out. Moses, how many centuries before Jesus? 
before Jesus was born as a person. Moses considered the reproach of Christ, Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. Moses knew about and served our Savior. By faith, the people left Egypt. By faith, Moses kept the Passover. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish. And then picking up at verse 32. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mock mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They were went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. All, all these people living by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. And all of these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. I know we've talked about that here before, but how amazing is that? They're still seeing it from afar. Why? Since God has provided something better for us that apart from us, us, along with all of those great people just listen, all of us, they should not be made perfect. Apart from us, they should not be made perfect. With us, they will be made perfect. And we live up to that by living by faith, for we are the righteous, and that's how we are to live, by faith. He goes on to say, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. That's why it's great to read through this passage often. We're surrounded by this cloud of witnesses, these people that went through all this stuff, walking by faith. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. We look at these examples and we can, we can just see there's something better. And they were ordinary people. They weren't great people until God got a hold of them and God was great through them. They were ordinary people. Look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. Well, then shorthand for the rest of chapter 12, Christ's endurance keeps us energized and courageous. Rely on him as you walk by faith, as you live by faith. The Lord disciplines us because he loves us and it helps us to live by faith. So stand up, the writer tells us, lift your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees, and move on. Strive for peace, strive for holiness. And I just wonder, how does all of this strike us? Is it sensible or is it nonsense? Is it easy peasy or does it sound way too hard? Is it worth the effort? Or not so much. One more flipping of the pages over to 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 6. To help us to walk by faith. To help us when things seem difficult. To help us when things seem frightening and hard. Paul says, so we are always of good courage. We know we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are good courage. We walk by faith and not by sight. Home in the body and away from the Lord. So that's the life we're living now. This is, this is between the, the, the from faith and in the middle of the, the two faith, right? From the saving faith to the faith that will take us into heaven. That's where we are now, walking by faith. And he adds here, we walk by faith and not by sight. 
It's, it's walking by faith and not by sight that, 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 that has the farmer put the seed in the ground. He has envisioned the field of corn. It's not there yet. It, it, that's, it's walking by faith that allows that to happen. And we know, even though we say seeing is believing, we know that that's only partially true. Inventions over, over uh, uh, the, the span of history have taught us that. You know, someone invented a telescope, and someone invented a microscope, and someone invented a prism. We've found out that there's all sorts of colors of light all around us that we can't see. That there are things far off in the galaxy that, that we, we couldn't see without that telescope. And there's things right here that I couldn't see without a microscope. Our sight is limited. So walking by faith is holding the hand of the one who can see into eternity. You know, imagine a, you know, a, a child walking holding the hands of, of mom or dad. In a, in, a, in a field of grass this tall, just trusting and plodding along because mom or dad can see above and beyond where they're walking. We walk by faith and not by sight. We get, a, we get the other side of this when we see Peter climb out of the boat and for a few tentative steps, he was walking by faith. And then he started walking by sight. <laughs> and the sight was the wind and the waves and the storm and he, and he began to sink. We walk by faith. We're, we're walking by the one who can see better than we can see, who can see all the way into eternity, who knows our hearts and our souls, and is sovereign over everything that is taking place in the world. And my brothers and my sisters, it is so worth it. Back to Hebrews 12, verse 18. Because this is where we're walking to. You remember the Old Testament warnings about approaching God incorrectly. Well, the writer tells us here, starting in verse 18, you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire, a darkness, and a gloom, and a tempest, and the sound of trumpet, of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. They could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches a mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festival gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, do you hear that? On that glorious day, all Christians will come to Christ, who's the mediator, who stood between us and God, our judge. And who do we join with? Who are we in that list? Who are we? We are the spirits of the righteous made perfect. All those others that couldn't approach God because it was before Calvary, we can approach God through Christ. We are the, the spirits of the righteous. And the day is coming when we will be made perfect. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's such tremendous promise for us to approach the unapproachable God because Christ has stood in, his, in our stead. And the wrath that should have poured out on us poured out instead on Christ as he hung on the cross. And we stand underneath him, protected forever and ever and ever. Friend, if you're hearing this and this is not you, if you've never believed in Christ for your eternity, then, then hear verses 25 through 27. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made in order that things that cannot be shaken may remain. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Do not turn from Christ even one more moment. 
Because for those of us whom Christ has saved, verse 28, therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So when God shakes the earth and he shakes the heaven, there are things that cannot be shaken. The kingdom of God will not be shaken. And the righteous who have been made perfect, those who are saved by the blood of Christ, will be in that kingdom and will not be shaken. So let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Brothers and sisters, we are the righteous. We are the righteous. If you've put your trust in Jesus, if he's saved you, if you've repented of your sins and turned to him, you are the righteous that Paul is talking about. We know we're righteous not because we earned it, not because we're good enough, but because Christ has done the work for our righteousness. We know that he gave us faith for faith, faith that saved us, faith that will carry us into glory, faith that will carry us home. And during that time between when we were saved and we enter heaven, may we live our lives by faith. Indeed, our vision is limited. So trust in the one who sees into eternity. Walk by faith and not by sight. Lord God, give us that courage. Give us that knowledge. Maybe settle in our souls that, that if we've turned our life to you, if we've trusted Jesus for our salvation, we are indeed the righteous ones. Imperfect in this world, but perfect in eternity. Made perfect by you, by your hand. We are your handiwork. God, may we take this. May it change how we think and what we do and what we say. And may we have a great longing to share this good news. In Jesus' name.
Friends, that is the power of the cross. That is when Jesus said, it is finished. As you've heard it said here before, he was not saying, I'm done. I'm going to stop reading. My heart's stopping. I'm dying. No, he said, it's finished. Death is finished. Satan is finished. There is time left. That, that, that fire is still burning out, but it is going out. Christ is winning. Christ will win. Finished was a victory, Christ, so that we may live lives from faith for faith, that we may live lives in this world. It's not about you be a Christian, you, you're, you're going to be healthy. Be a Christian, you're going to have a lot of money. Read through Hebrews 11. You'll see that's just simply not a promise. But the promise is Christ with you every single moment. We walk by faith. Living faithful lives. Ready to enter that kingdom of God. Ready to join up with all those from the past, from, from Abraham and David, all those waiting for us to complete the kingdom of God. So what do we do today? And what do we do tomorrow? We walk by faith. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you all the health, happiness, wholeness, all that is peace with God. May he give you shalom. Amen.